tonight is going to be a very interesting study. Last week we started an introduction on deception, but tonight we're going to get into some nuts and bolts of where all this started. And um, of course it started in the garden uh, with, with the serpent, with Satan, tempting Adam and Eve. But we're going to see some very interesting things tonight that I am almost guaranteeing that most people haven't seen. It's, it's, um, it takes a lot of digging in to get some of this stuff. But hopefully you learned some stuff tonight. Uh, you can take it home and do some study on your own. So last week, uh, we finished up talking about false prophets, talking about the narrow way. Uh, false prophets trying to get Christians off the narrow way, making everything sound good, palatable to make Christians uh, feel like they're um, either they're too rigid or they're too bigoted, you know, to try to make, make everything sound good and sweet, right? So tonight, I want to start off by a phrase or a term that the Greek world in antiquity used to use for men. If they were grounded in whatever they, whatever faith they had or whatever they were doing, if they were grounded and established in what they were doing, they were called stasis. So they would say, this man is stasis. And so a lot of words come off of this, but you have apostasis. Um, but it's a firm standing. And the reason I put that up there and stated that term is because as we go through what we're going through tonight, I want to make sure that everybody here, even though there's not a whole lot of people here, is stasis, is grounded in what the Word of God says. And so Proverbs, Proverbs 30, let's turn there real quick. Proverbs 30. Verse 5. I want to ensure that I'm reading this clearly. Verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Verse 6. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. I want to ensure that I let you know again that you need to be, we need to be focused on the purity of God's word. It is pure. And we need to have a firm standing on God's word when we start learning things like this. Because you're going to see it is very manipulative and it's very deceptive. All right? So. First thing I want to do is talk about a few things that are a little off subject, but I think they're important. Distress and perplexity of nations. Luke 21, 25. The Lord Jesus is talking about what's going to happen in the end. He's talking about the signs and wonders, and we talk about false prophets and being deceived. But he also says in Luke 21, 25 that there's going to be distress and perplexity of nations. Luke 21, 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity and sea and the waves roaring. Now the word distress, I want to break this down because this is important. The word distress is so nuke. That word means a pushing together as if forcing things through a strait. We talked about what a strait was. Tight gate, a small space, pushing, crunching things together to get it through there. That's what distress means. Perplexity is aporia, that word aporia. Now, we talked a little bit about the Greek, but every time you see an A, 
it is negating the word after it. It's called a negative particle. So when we read this word, it's going to be the opposite because it has the A right there. Poria comes from the word porous, which is a way or a resource. So that word aporia or perplexity means to have no answers. We are at wit's end, not knowing how to proceed. That's what perplexity means. I wrote these words up here. For one, we know that there was a tragedy that happened in Las Vegas over the weekend, right? We, did we hear about this? Yes. About the people getting shot? Um, there, we need to be praying for the families of these things, the hurricanes and all the things that are going on. These things are perplexing. We have no idea what to do about these things. We had the most massive storm come through the Atlantic Ocean, uh, the most, uh, what was it, the biggest massacre in American history. You know, these kind of things are taking place all the time. And so, when we talk about perplexity, now I'm just talking about America, all right? What are we going to do about racism? How many different answers do we have to fix the issue? Right? We have about 50 answers. Everybody has a different answer. Nobody can figure out what's, what we're going to do. What about immigration? We can't figure out what to do. Do we build a wall? Do we build a fence? Do we not? Do we let people in? Do we, you see? What about the refugees who are sweeping across the world by the, by the hundreds of thousands? And when they get to Europe, they are offered the Red Cross and they deny the Red Cross. But they're hungry. They've got kids in their arms. They're thirsty. What, why are they denying this Red Cross? How is it that hundreds of thousands are coming up from South America? And then it ends up being that there's some ISIS infiltrated in with the Mex Mexicans or the, you see, all kinds of stuff is going on with the refugees. What about ISIS? We can't figure out what to do with these people. They're claiming every crime that happens all around the earth. Everything. Every bombing, every shooting, every uh, everything. They're claiming. What do we do about it? What about Israel and Palestine? They've been fighting for thousands of years. Or well, not thousands of years, but since 1948 when they became a nation, it, was, it has been that the Palestinians say, this is our land. Israel says, no, God, give us this land. It's been all over the place. There's been wars after wars after wars. What are we going to do about that? What about hunger and poverty? All over the place. The one percenters got all the money. Everybody else is poor. You see? What is a fascist? That's a big word now, right? If anybody doesn't know what that term means, I urge you to go look at your American history and look at the Democratic Party. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying anything about Republican, Democrat, they're the same thing to me. But they have a lot to do with this right here. So people are saying, you got anti-fa, anti-fascist, you're a fascist if you're a Republican, you're a fascist if you're a Democrat. You see all these kind of words are being thrown out there, these pet words. What are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about people dropping uh, or, or burning down all the statues and, and you know, breaking them down in all the buildings and all the stuff that they're doing, all the rioting? What are we going to do? What about the sodomites? Sodomites meaning homosexuals, transsexuals, pansexuals, asexuals, the, bi the binary thing where they're putting 50 different genders on the, on the applications and the school applications. What are we going to do about that? How do we treat those people? How, how do we handle that when God it clearly in his word says that these things are an abomination? They're a perversion. How do we handle that as Christians? Or how does the world handle that? What about political correctness? I can't even say a Muslim. I can't say an Arabian. I have, you know, I got to say, uh, you know, I can't say a black man. I got to say African-American or I got, we have, uh, we have all kinds of things going on. So is this perplexity? We have no answers. Nobody has an answer. You can get on there and look on the news media and everybody's just fighting back and forth. Nobody comes up with nothing. Donald Trump says this. Barack Obama, who's still in, in Washington, says this. And they're all still fighting. But nobody's coming up with anything, including the church. So I said that to say this. There's a note. All of this fits into the direction that the world is supposed to go. All right? All this is happening to fulfill prophecy. God, do you not think that God knows what's going on? He knows everything. He knows what's going on. This is happening for a reason. Now, to really get a clear picture of why all this is happening to fulfill prophecy, we have to go back. We have to go back. 
All right? And we're going to go back, and you're going to be astonished at some of the things you hear. Um, it was perplexing to me to hear these things. So, I want to quote Alexander Hislop right quick from the two Babylons. These are some, these right here are a lot of the me, references that I took this information from. All right? So you can come up here, you can write them down, you can look these things up. I've actually printed out some of the pages that we're going to read from the book itself. But these things you can go back and, and look me up. So Alexander Hyssops, Hyssop says, um, The Tower of Babel was actually the worship of Satan in the form of fire, the sun, and the serpent. However, Satan worship could not be done openly because of the many who still believed in the true God of Noah. So a mystery religion began at Babel where Satan could be worshipped in secret. Turn to Revelation 17.5. I think probably every preacher who's ever preached has said this, has read out of Revelation 17 about the prophecy. 17.5. We'll start at 4. 17.4. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of the abominations and filthiness of her fornication. And upon her forehead was the name Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. We don't know. Babylon was the mother of all idolatry, all harlotry, and all counterfeits. Everything counterfeit that you see in the Christian religion, we're going to see a little bit here in a minute, comes from Babylon. It all stems from Babylon. Now, we're going to do a little bit of history right quick. Turn to Revelation 2. Revelation 2. Revelation 2, verse 12. This is the Lord Jesus speaking to John, telling him to write a letter to the church of church in Pergamos, write these things, saith he, which hath thus the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works, and where you dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. All right. So if everything started in Babylon, why is it saying that Satan's seat is in Pergamos? Alexander Hislop tells us exactly why. This is what he says. I don't know if you guys know this or not, but if you look up history, papacy, the papacy, the pope, the pontiff, pontifus maximus, has been around way before the Roman Empire. It's been around for a long time. And this is going to tell you right here. So the papacy... Still the sovereign pontiff of Rome, even after the Estrusian idolatry was absorbed into the Roman system, was only an offshoot from the grand original Babylonian system. The Pope, he was a devoted worshiper of the Babylonian God, but he was not the legitimate represent, representative of that God. The true legitimate Babylonian pontiff had his seat Beyond the bounds of the Roman Empire, that seat after the death of Belshazzar by the Medo-Persian kings was at Pergamos, where afterwards was one of the seven churches of Asia. We remember who Belshazzar is. Who is Belshazzar? Was that Daniel? He is Belteshazzar. Belteshazzar. That's Daniel. Belshazzar is who? Sir. The king in uh, Babylon. Yes. 
So then, Nebuchadnezzar? Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. Grandson. All right? So Belshazzar was the one. He's sitting in having this big party with all the princes. He says, go get all the, go get all the, the, uh, the ornaments and the dishes and all the gold from the Jerusalem temple. Bring it here so we can drink out of it. All right? It was an abomination that he did that. And when he did that, all this stuff was going on. Then you see the handwriting on the wall, right? God writes on there that his kingdom is going to be taken from him. They bring Daniel in, and he explains to the king that tonight the kingdom is going to be taken from you. All right? And that's what he explains right there. The, uh, after the death of Belshazzar, that night when the Medo-Persian uh, Medo kings came and took over, it says that the defeated Chaldeans, who are the Chaldeans? Chaldeans. Well, they're the ones that actually captured um, Israel and took them captive. Right. They're, that's the people, the Chaldean people. So you have the Chaldean priests who are the, uh, when Nebuchadnezzar says, bring in all the magi magicians and the Chaldeans and the astronomers, right? Those are the priests or the astronomers, the, the, uh, uh, the mathematicians and the astronomers of the day. So it says, the defeated Chaldeans fled to Asia Minor and fixed their central college at Pergamos. So this is what happened. Medo-Persia comes in, Cyrus comes in, he takes over, kills Belshazzar, and then the Chaldeans flee. The main portion of the Chaldeans, the mathematicians and the priests, the Babylonian pontiffs, if you will, went to Pergamos and set up the seat right there. And so, Pergamos and the hierarchy there, yet in course of time, the pontificate of Rome... And the pontificate of Pergamos came to be identified. Pergamos itself became part of the parcel of the Roman Empire. Uh, when Attalus, the last of the kings at his death, left by his will all his dominions to the Roman people. For some time after the kingdom of Pergamos was merged in the Roman dominions. There was no one that could set himself openly and advisedly to lay claim to all the dignity inherent to the old title of the kings of Pergamos. The original powers, even of the Roman pontiffs, seemed to have been uh, by that time abridged. But when Julius Caesar, who had previously been elected Pontifus Maximus, and if you look up Pontifus Maximus, it's actually a priest. It's an it's a old pagan priest. Became also as the emperor, the supreme uh, civil ruler of the Romans, then as the head of the Roman state and the head of the Roman religion. All of the powers and functions of the true legitimate Babylonian pontiff were supremely vested in him. So the starting of the Roman Empire with Julius Caesar, he took all the Babylonian worship and he brought it into Rome. And he actually was worshipped as a sun god, if you could continue to read. But, so this is how it went from Babylon to Pergamos to the Roman Empire. That's how it happened. All right? Now we know in between the Roman Empire and Babylon was Greece, right? Greece was in between there. Plato, if you know anything about Plato, he was the pusher of the Babylonian religion. If you read about him, he talks about the universal life force and all the things that Plato talked about. He's a philosopher, but he was, uh, he, he said a lot of seemingly smart things, but it was Babylonian in origin. So let's continue on. Now, I got some PowerPoint, a little bit of PowerPoint for you. And I want to show you all something very interesting that's relevant to today. This right here is the altar of Pergamos, or otherwise called the altar of Zeus. Y'all see that? The altar of Zeus. Where's that at in Pergamos? This was, this was the altar that was at Pergamos. All right? Now listen to this. We, see, we saw in, in uh, verse uh, 13 there of Revelation chapter 2, when the Lord Jesus says, You have not, not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr. Right? Antipas was martyred at this altar right here in Pergamos, all right? 
Now this is what would happen when they would martyr somebody on this altar. There was a bull inside the altar, inside one of these chambers here. And what they would do is they would put the person inside this bull who was sitting upright like this, and they would tie him in inside the bull in such a way that his head was where the bull's head was. So he looked just like the bull when he was tied in. And then the, what they would do is they would light a fire up under the bull, and they would basically cook that person on the inside. The, bra the brass and the brazen bull would just heat up, and then the, you would see all the smoke coming out, and they would burn on the inside, roast, basically like an oven. And the bull had orifices for the nostrils, which smoke would come out, sort of like a barbecue pit, and he had a, a hole for his mouth. And the person inside who was being martyred, would, when they would moan, everybody would gather around and celebrate because it sounded like the bull came alive. That's what happened to Antipas right here on this altar. Now, here's something very interesting. Does anybody recognize this? Oh my gosh. Anybody recognize this? Didn't Hitler speak there? Nuremberg, Germany, 1935, Hitler did speak there. Who knows what the Nuremberg Laws are? The Nuremberg Laws were at this very moment in time is when Hitler said that all the Jews, all their rights are stripped, they are no longer German citizens, and this is ultimately, ultimately what led to the Holocaust. Oh, wow. All right? Do you see... Oh, this is pointer work? That doesn't work on this. Okay. I'm going to use this. See the red pointer there? Yeah. You see this long part up top here? This is what it looks like now. All right? Wow. That's what it looks like now. That long, that top part up there, do you see the columns that come down? Mm -hmm. And the two things on the side? Mm -hmm. Let's go back. <gasps> now listen to this. The Germans in 1930 took the Pergamos altar down brick by brick in Pergamos. They took it from Pergamos, brick by brick, and reassembled it in the... Pergamus Museum in Berlin in the 30s. Hitler assigned and commissioned a man named Albert Speer, chief architect for the Nazi party, to design the parade grounds for Nuremberg. Speer took his inspiration from the Pergamus altar and created it in his own way to go along with Hitler's speech at Nuremberg where the Nuremberg Laws were established to take away the rights of the Jews and ultimately led to the Holocaust, September 15, 1935. Now, who recognizes this? Two thousand eight DNC convention, Barack Obama. That's his. That's in Denver, Colorado. Any resemblance? Yeah. Here's why. Scary. A month before this uh, convention right here, he was in Berlin, Germany. Wow. And hardly any other candidate in the history of the presidency was going overseas while they were campaigning to be president of the United States. But he was one of them. And that's exactly where he went. And amazing, he demanded to have this made for this purpose. Now, I want you to think about this. Hitler, we know about his regime. We know about all the things that he did to the Jews. He took the seat of Satan and brought it to Germany. And what happened? Six million Jews were killed. All kinds of things were going on. And then Obama brings the seat of Satan to America. And obviously, this is what's happening. Now, does that have any connection? Maybe. Where's this at? This is in Denver, 2008. 
This is when the famous, and I don't know if you've seen it or not, but the famous quote, yes we can. Y'all remember that? Yes we can. Mm -hmm. Who knows that in the occult world, which we're going to talk about a little bit right now, that it doesn't matter how things are spelled or it doesn't matter how things are said, they can be said backwards. For the occult world, it all means the same thing. If you play Yes We Can backwards, mm -hmm. what does it say? Thank you, Satan. Thank you, Satan. Uh -huh. That's exactly what it says. Mm -hmm. You have all these people, and you look at the crowd of people, it was a massive amount of people. He continually, that was his, that was the line over and over and over. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. And the people were shouting that to the top of their lungs. Amazing how he's at the seat of Satan and he's able to use that line and have everybody say that without knowing. So, let's continue on. Play it backwards. Play it backwards. Yes. You have to play it. You'd have to listen to the audio and play the audio backwards. Look it up. They've done it. You can actually even do it yourself. Yep. Like if you just take the audio and then reverse it yourself to make sure it wasn't messed with, you actually hear it yourself. That's a very disturbing thing. Very disturbing. So, Pergamos. We know how... Babylon goes to Greece through Plato and others, and how it goes to Pergamos and then into the Roman Empire. Well, we also know that the Roman Empire mixed in with Christianity, all right? Got mixed in. And we're going to learn a little bit about that, not tonight, but we'll learn a little bit about the Edict of Tolerance that Constantine put together because of the invading tribes that were coming in. He actually made an edict to make everybody happy. That's what it was about, all right? So Christianity was involved in that. So, but what is the beginning of all this? What's the beginning? Is Barack Obama saying something that you don't know? He's absolutely saying something you don't know. Are these politicians, are the people who are like Jim Carrey, walking around saying things that are, they sound biblical, but they're not biblical, why is that and how can that be? And how is it that we Christians are ignorant to it? And it's because we don't study this right here. The ancient mystery schools, and I, I want to warn you again. I'm going to say this again before we get started. Stasis. We need to make sure that we are grounded, understanding that the word of God is pure. Because you're about to see some things that is going to confuse you. If you've never seen it before, and I'm going to try to keep everybody on track, but make sure you understand that the Word of God is pure. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I don't want to sound ignorant, but anyway, is like Barack Obama, I mean, not to point your fingers, but as they're saying what they're saying, are they aware that that says that backwards? Yes, we can. Do they know that? Are, is, in other words, is Saint working in their lives unaware that they're not even aware that they're uh, saying things that would be uh, right with Satan other than with God? Do, do they know that to themselves? Let's, do, let's, you think that they're, they, do you think that they are a Saint worshiper? Let's, let's move through this, and it'll probably answer your question. Okay. It'll probably answer your question. Turn to Luke 12. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 2 and 3 says this. The Lord Jesus says, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever you have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which you have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Alice A. Bailey I want to read something from her. We studied her a little bit. 
Anybody remember her? Mm-hmm. Does anybody not remember who she is? Alice A. Bailey was a disciple of Helena Blavatsky, who brought about basically uh, into into the into the world's eye uh, the New Age type movement, Christ consciousness movement. Right. I want to read what she has to say about mysteries right quick. Now, this word esoteric, who can tell you what that means? Esoteric. Esoteric means hidden. Hidden knowledge. The Lord Jesus says everything is going to be revealed. All right? Now listen to this. The ancient mysteries, this is from her, uh, it's called The Reappearance of the Christ in her book. This is pagan. It's a cult. I don't believe anything she's saying, but listen to what she's saying. The ancient mysteries were originally given to humanity by the hierarchy and contain the entire clue to the evolutionary process. Hidden in numbers, in ritual, in words, and in symbology. These veil the secrets of man's origin and destiny, picturing to him in rite and ritual the long, long path which he must tread back into the light. They provide also, when rightly interpreted and correctly represented, the teaching which humanity needs in order to pass from darkness to light. How does somebody pass from darkness to light? There's only one name, right? That's how you pass from darkness to light. Jesus. She's saying that the mysteries have to be interpreted to pass from darkness to light. That's what she's saying. From the unreal to the real and from death to immortality, you have to be able to rightly interpret and correctly represent the mysteries. Any true, let me ask you, I'm going to ask everybody here again, is there any Freemasons in here? All right. If you were, you probably wouldn't tell me, but uh, she talks about the Masons in here. Any true Mason who understands, if only to a slight degree, the significance of the three degrees of the Blue Lodge and the implications of that uh, that it has in which he participates, will recognize the above three phases for what they are and will recognize the significance of the three degrees. I mention it here with Masonic purpose because it is closely related to the restoration of the mysteries and has held the clue down through the ages to that long-awaited restoration to the platform above which the required teaching can be based and the structure which can express when free from its Jewish names and nomenclature, which are long out of date, through uh, through 3,000 years, the history of man's moving forward upon the path of return. In these mysteries which Christ will restore upon his reappearance, thus reviving the churches in new form and restoring the hidden mystery which they long have lost through their materialism. Masonry has also lost the true livingness in once, it once possessed, but in its forms and rituals, the truth is preserved and can be recovered. This Christ will do. He will also revive these mysteries in other ways. Not all will seek the church or masonry for the revitalizing of their spiritual life. The true mysteries will also reveal themselves through science, and the incentive to search for them where there will be given by the Christ. The mysteries contain within their formulas and teachings the key to the science which will unlock the mysteries of electricity, the greatest spiritual science, an area of divine knowledge in the world, the fringes of which have only just been touched. We talked about these people. Alice Bailey. Robert Mueller, Benjamin Krim, Helena Blavatsky, who talk about the Christ, the reappearance of the Christ. He's coming back. Maitreya, right? The one who's going to cut. All the religions have a Savior coming back. And there's going to be one. Maitreya. They say the Lord Maitreya is the one that covers all of them. He's going to be the one that comes back. The chosen one. That's who they're talking about, the Christ. They're not talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. They're talking about the Antichrist. And she says that this Christ is going to come back and unlock all these mysteries. 
these esoteric hidden mysteries that are in Mason, Freemasonry, the Goodfellas, or what was it they called? The good, uh, all these secret lodges and skull and bones and all these hidden things that you see, these, uh, uh, the signs and the, you know, the zodiac and all this stuff, they're going to come back. His disciples and this Christ is going to come back and reveal all these things that we're all in the church is going to go, wow, we just didn't really know all this stuff. And this is the true Christ. Jesus Christ is not the true Christ. He is. He's revealing all these things to us. That's what they believe. Do I believe that there's going to be a lot of people who claim to be Christian that fall into that? Absolutely. Signs and wonders. Right? He's going to reveal a lot of stuff. Now the word mystery is the word mysterion. Mysterion. Make sure I get it right here. This is this was pretty interesting. It means to shut the mouth. This is in your concordance, by the way. This exact definition is in your concordance. Through the idea. Of silence. Imposed by initiation into a religious rite. That's what the concordance says about a mystery. It is, let's take Freemasonry for instance. A first, second, third degree Mason, a Mason will tell you that he's a Christian, that we have a Bible, we read out of the Bible in our lodge, and they'll tell you all these different things. But they won't tell you that there's a secret language that they have, there's a little book that they have that they read to each other, there's a little secret handshakes that they have, signs and symbols inside the lodge. They, a lot of them don't know what it means, but they're up and coming. There's a lot of things that they're going to shut their mouth. They're not going to tell you. You see? And only the initiated are going to understand these mysteries. Not the... You see, when it comes to news media, when it comes to newspapers, us on the lower end, the bottom end of society, we only get what we're fed. Right? We're not getting the truth about a lot of things. We're only getting what we're fed. But the initiated, the one percenters... Right? The elite, the globalists, whatever you want to call them. There's some hidden knowledge, esoteric things that they got going on. Some mysteries that they believe that they know that we don't know. And because of that, we're stupid. And we're brute beasts. We're dumb. All right? That's the way they treat us. So a mystery is that they're going to shut their mouth. Yes, sir. I got a, when they speak of this where it says uh, there shall be nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither shall there be hid anything will be, shall be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye shall have spoken in darkness shall be heard in light, and that which was spoken in uh, the ear is uh, uh, closed shall be uh, proclaimed upon the house top. Well, what I'm, is that Christian or is that non-Christian? Because... As we come into Christ, and I thought, I mean, I'm speaking of sins. God said that your sins would be wiped away as far as the east is from the west. So, I mean, is that what we're talking about, revealing your sins? Or what are we talking about there? Well, if you see right there, he's talking, he says, beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Right? He's, he's talking about the Pharisees, talking to his disciples. And he's talking about the Pharisees, about how hypocritical they are. Right? And then he starts talking about there are things that they are hiding. They are masking themselves. That's what a hypocrite is. It's an actor who, who puts a mask on. Right? Yeah. And he says all, th all these things that, are, that you guys don't see are going to be jerked away. Now, watch this. The word revelation. I'm going to ask you a question. The word revelation. When it says the revelation of Jesus Christ. Apocalypsis. That's what it means. That's, that's the word. It comes from apocalypto. The word apo means removal. Calypto means cover. A removal of the cover. 
You see, the revelation of Jesus Christ is going to be a revealing of who he is. You see, the mysteries of Christ. But still, is that the unsaved or, or it could it be the saved? It could be everybody. He's letting them know that the, what he's letting them know is don't be like the, hip, the hypocrites who are masking. Okay. Everything that is, is hidden is going to be revealed. Okay. All right? That's what he's saying. Everything that's in darkness is going to come to light. Right. I'm putting, in, putting it in this context. They are saying that when the Christ comes back, that he's going to reveal all these mysteries. For us, this is why we need to pay attention. I'm only introducing you to this to introduce you to this. All right? So... I want y'all to listen to this. This was dictated before. I wrote this down in my own language so we can understand it better. But it was dictated before. So, and I don't even, I, I, I have verified all the points through Alexander Hislop, Albert Pike, all these people. But it's very interesting to hear this. And like I said, I want to say this again. Think about how pure God's word is, because we're about to, I'm about to show you some interesting things. So the ancient mystery schools began in Babylon, all right? All this esoteric knowledge began here in Babylon. The, so here we go. I'm going to read this point by point. Just listen to what I have to say. The ancient mystery schools have understood the beginnings of human beings to be evolutionary, Right? We came from animals. We came from fish, or, you know, and then we were monkeys, and then now we're human beings. Evolution. They believe in evolution. Man, now again, this is what they believe. I'm reading the points. This is what they believe, okay? Man came from an animalistic nature, and over the course of millennia, began slowly to figure out through brain power how to make tools for building, how to make weaponry for hunting, and how to defend his family or, or hunting for, to defend his family and for hunting, and how to speak language to communicate. This process learned, le uh, led to further advancement of technology and thought. But through all the success in the ancient times in these areas, there was still one thing they could not overcome. And according to the mysteries, the sustaining and greatest enemy to be feared was by far the darkness of night. And all its unknown dangers that came with it. Who's drove on a Michigan road in the backwoods when they ain't no light? It's about one of the scariest things. If you just cut your headlights off, you can't see nothing. Now imagine ancient man back in the backwoods of Michigan. That's the way it was all over the earth. There was no light except for fire, right when they created fire. Man's first enemy was darkness. Understanding this fact alone, we can now see why the greatest friend that the human race could ever have was heaven's greatest gift to the world, that glorious rising orb of day, the sun. All right? With this simple truth laid out, we can now begin to dig into the most ancient and most successful religion that has ever existed in the world. Okay? With that simple truth. Its success lies in its ability to remain hidden. There were no people in the ancient world that believed that the sun, every time I say sun, I'm saying S-U-N. Yeah. All right? Now listen to me now. There was no ancient people in the world that believed that the sun was the almighty God, the creator of heaven and earth, the all-powerful God. Every nation and culture throughout the ancient world thought the sun to be the glory of the unseen creator of the heavens. King David said, the heavens declare the glory of God. Psalm 19, 1. And Malachi, I want you to turn there right quick, Malachi 4. say this in between when we're reading. If Satan can destroy your faith in the word of God you have no shield you have no cover, you have no protection. 
If he can destroy it, that's exactly what's going to happen. So as we read this, the word of God is pure. I want to continue to remind you of that. All right? Malachi 4, verse 1 and 2. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, and all that wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts. But it shall leave them neither root nor branch, but unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. What did we see right there? The son of righteousness. Look how it's spelled. S-S-S-U-N. See that? Ancient people reasoned that no human being could ever lay claim to the ownership of the sun in the heavens. It must belong, therefore, to the unseen creator in the universe. It became, figuratively speaking, not man's, but God's son. Truly, God's son was the light of the world. John 8, 12, right? Mankind was vulnerable in the darkness on this planet and forced to wait for the rising of the sun every morning to chase away the mental and physical anxieties brought on by the darkness. Therefore, the morning sun, the Lord Jesus is called the bright morning star in Revelation 22. While man focused on his dependence toward heaven to assure his frail existence on earth, the sun became the symbol of divine benevolence from heaven. For without the sun, there was no light, there was no warmth, and nothing could grow or live upon the face of the earth. As small fires brought a limited light into man's world of darkness, the great fire of day served the whole earth with its heavenly presence. For this reason, it was said that the God of the Bible was a consuming fire. Hebrews 12, 29. It was said that the place for mankind is on the earth, but the sun dwelt in heavenly, heavenly places. He resides in heaven. Man saw in his male offspring his own image and proved his existence through his son. It was assumed that God's son was the visible rep representation of the unseen creator in heaven. It was said, when you have seen the son, you have seen the father. The father is glorified in his son. Do you see this? Are we making some connections here? Ancient man had no problem understanding that all life-giving energy on the earth came from the sun. Consequently, all life was lost without the sun. It followed that God's son was nothing less than man's savior. Since energy from the sun gave life and, make, and man takes his energy from the food that was given life by the sun, that would mean that the sun would have to give up its life-supporting energy so that we may continue to live. God's son must have given, he must give his life for us to live. God's son. That's S-U-N. S-U-N. This is what they believe yeah. You see that? Yeah. Now, who knows who Albert Pike is? You do? <laughs> who is he? Um, I believe he was a general in the Confederate uh, Civil War. He was? Yes, and he was a 33rd degree Mason. He was? And he wrote a book called Morals and Dogma. And he also wrote in letters uh, to other Masons around that time predicting World War I, World War II, and an upcoming World War III. He did. Yes, he did. Albert Pike. If you don't know, there's no 33, 33rd degree Mason. That's an honorary degree. He was the highest degree you can be, 32nd, but he was the honorary 33rd. He was way up there. He wrote this book for the Masters of the Lodge, Morals and Dogma. You will never find this book on the shelf. Never. Paperback. You're never going to find it. It's only in a masonry lodge. You'll find it on the internet. 
You'll find them electronically, but you will never be able to hold that book in your hand because it's not meant for the peasant. See, it's meant for the masters of the lodge. This is what he has to say about the sun. The sun is the ancient symbol of the life-giving and generative power of the deity. To the ancients, light was the cause of life. Light was the cause of life. And God was the source from which all light flowed, the essence of light, the invisible fire, developed as flame manifested as light and splendor. The sun was his manifestation and visible image. The Sabians, who remembers the Sabians? Job, right? The Sabians came and took all the, right? They killed, killed what was it, the camels that they took? Or the, the Sabians worshipped the light God seemed to worship the sun, in whom they saw the manifestation of the deity. The sun represents the actual light. He pours upon the moon his uh, sundating rays, sorry, both shed their light upon their offspring, the blazing star or Horus, and the three form the great equilateral, equilateral triangle in the center of which the omnificent letter of the Kabbalah by which creation is said to have been affected. Okay, so he's talking about the triangle. We've all seen this, right? Triangle with the all-seeing eye at the top. He's saying that the sun and the moon and the, the blazing star create those, and that's the deity. It's the Godhead. Three and one. Then it became the image of Horus, the son of Osiris. Himself symbolized also as the sun. The blazing star of glo or glory in the center refers us to that grand luminary, the sun, which enlightens the earth and by its genial influence dispenses blessings to mankind. It's Albert Pike in the 1800s talking like that. This is a man who has a statue in Washington. Now imagine, why is it? That the rebel flag can be torn down all over the South, but a Confederate general statue can stand mm -hmm. in Washington. Right. Do you understand that this man is connected? That's why he can stand. He's connected. Here we go. Continuing on. Mm -hmm. The mystery schools think that Christianity is a perversion of the mysteries. They think you are the perverse one. They think that you have taken from them that your Bible was taken from them. And the words that they say, you've only made it sound, made, you've taken the Son and made it the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. You see how this works. <laughs> While it was true that our life was sustained by our Savior, God's Son, S-U-N, it would only be, true, uh, be as true as long as the Son returned each morning and our hope of salvation would be secure only in the risen Savior. For if he did not rise from his grave of darkness, all would be lost. All the world waited on his imminent return each morning. Wow. I mean, is, not, is this not language that we talk about? That's right. We're waiting on him, yes. right? Yes. The Father would never leave us at the mercy of this world of darkness. The heavenly promise was surely that he will come again, John 14, 3. To light our path and to save those who are in darkness. Logically, even if man died on the earth, as long as the sun came each day, life on earth would continue forever. Therefore, the ancient texts say that everlasting life was a gift God gives through his son. Do we understand that? Mm -hmm. This is what they mean. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, S-U-N, that we may have everlasting life on earth. This is not a personal salvation. This is life will continue forever as long as the sun continues to go up and down. As long as he rises every morning, there will continually be life on the earth. Not personal salvation. They didn't believe in that. Since evil or harm presented themselves at night, it only makes sense that evil or harm are works of darkness. With the return of the sun each morning, man felt more secure in the world and therefore was at peace. God's son, with his warm rays of hope, was called the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 9, 6. 
The reverse would also be true. The evil of night was ruled over by the prince of darkness. Evil was of the darkness. Good was of the light. Light was good. Darkness was bad. The light of God's son was equated with righteousness and truth. And the ancient priests always followed the light toward the east. They considered themselves illuminated. Turn to Ezekiel 8. It came to pass in the sixth year, let me just say this, Ezekiel is part of the three waves of uh, the captivity into Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, all right? He's up there on the river, river Shabar, uh, and, and he's actually told to, uh, God gives, starts giving him visions that he's supposed to talk to the children of Israel. So in chapter 8, here we go. It came to pass in the sixth year, in the sixth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I sat in my house... And the elders of Judah sat before me, that the hand of the Lord fell there upon me. Then I beheld, and lo, the likeness as the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his loins, even downward fire, and from his loins even upward, as the appearance of brightness, as the color of amber. But he put forth the form of a hand, and took me up by a lock of my head, and the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and brought me into the visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the inner gate that looked toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoked to jealousy. We're not going to get into that. But anyways, Ezekiel is taken. He's in, he's in Babylon. He's taken from a vision, and he goes, God takes him to Jerusalem, to the temple. Right? There's the temple. This is east, north. South, west, I'm sorry, south, north, east, all right? That's the way the temple was laid out. He takes him in where he's looking north. And behold, the glory of God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then said he unto me, Son of man, lift up your eyes now. The way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward, at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. He said, Furthermore, unto me, Son of man, seeth, do you see what they do? Even the great abominations that the house of Israel commits here, that I should go far off from my sanctuary. But turn ye again, turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations. And he brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, behold, a hole in the wall. Then said he unto me, Son of man, dig now into the wall. And when I had digged into the wall, behold, a door. So he's telling them. He brings it to the gate of the court. This is the court. Brings it to the gate. He says, dig into the wall. He starts digging into the wall. And he finds a door. A hidden door. Okay. And he says, so I, uh, let's see. I digged into the wall and behold a door. And he said unto me, go in and behold the wicked abominations that they do here. So I went in and saw and behold every form of creeping things and abominable beasts and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed upon the walls round about. What does that sound like? To me, that sounds like Egypt. Birds and spiders and all the things that they had, pirate, all the things they had on their walls, they painted them on there. This is in the temple. Okay. In the temple of God, there's men who are going underground and worshiping, putting these things that they worship, these creeping things and all the animals and all these things on the walls, like Egypt, right? And there stood before even 70 men, 70 men of the ancients of the house of Israel. These are the leaders of the house of Israel, and they're down there doing this. And in the midst of them stood... Uh, Jezaniah, the son of Shaphan, 
uh, with every man his censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Who's ever seen the Pope? When he walks up, he's doing the, the Mass. When he's doing the Mass, he's got this big, uh, this big golden ball with a chain on it, and he's waving it around, he's waving it across, right? And all these things. That's, an in, that's a censer full of incense, and there's smoke everywhere. Now imagine being in a room, and all these men have these things, and they're waving them around, and there's incense everywhere, right? Then he said unto me, Son of man, have you seen what the ancients of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the chambers of his imagery. For they say, the Lord see us not. The Lord has forsaken the earth. They don't think God sees them when they're doing this mess. Then he also said unto me, turn ye yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations than this, than they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. Now, I mean, unless you study this, you don't know who Tammuz is. Go back into the history, and you'll see that Tammuz is Horus, Mercury, Tammuz. This is the son of Nimrod. What it is? And in the in the in the Babylonian times, Samaramis was the mother and the wife of Nimrod. Nimrod was the mighty hunter before the Lord. He was the one that created Babel, which became Babylon. And when he got, uh, they say Shem, this is the, they say Shem cut him up in a bunch of pieces and scattered them all over the place, Shem. And so Samaramis went and looked, started looking for him, had helpers looking for him. And when they finally found him, we'll bring this up, but they were missing one part. The male organ was missing one part. Who's ever seen this? The Washington Monument. Who's ever seen that? Big thing, right? Mm -hmm. That is Nimrod's private part. She made that. Samaramis made that because that's the only part that she can find of his body. Nimrod. You see them all over the place in the world. They're called obelisks. All right? So, Tammuz is the son of Nimrod and Samaramis. There was festivals. Samaramis held these festivals. Forty days they would weep for their son, Tammuz, who got killed as well. And Samaramis made everybody do these 40 days of weeping. And if you go back... This is exactly where Lent comes from. 40 days of fasting, right? She would make everybody stop what they're doing, give up something throughout these 40 days, and they would all weep for Tammuz. His name also is Adonis. Who's ever seen that new movie, Creed? It's a boxing movie, Rocky movie, that has the black dude in it. Right? His name is Adonis, yeah. by the way. Interesting. So they were weeping for Tammuz. Then, then he said unto me, Have you seen this? Or hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and you shall see greater abominations than these. And he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and behold, at the door of the temple. Here's the temple. Right? The temple's right here. He's inside the court at the door of the temple. The very door that the priests go into. Between the porch and the altar were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east and they worship the sun toward the east. Hmm. God's people. That sounds like music. God's people are worshiping the sun. They're facing the east. Which, by the way, the Lord Jesus, where's the Mount of Olives? Right here on the east. And it says the Lord, the sun, God's son, is going to come back to the east. And he's coming through this gate right here. You see that? So they're sitting right here waiting for the sun to come up. Worshiping the sun, touching branches to their noses, and there's all kinds of stuff that you can uh, look up about that. But 
they're kind of skeptical on, on what the deal is with the branch touching the nose. They think it has something to do with breath or something. But So you have 25 men waiting on the sun to come up, worshiping the sun. You know, I want to make sure that you understand that there is, in all my study and belief, a Babylonian influence in the church. Who knows what that is? Easter sunrise service. Who knows what it is? Yes. Uh, isn't it what the Catholics do? They Actually, it's what the Protestants do. Protestants? Huh. Yeah. Anybody? Nobody's heard of this? You guys have never done it in this church? It's, We've it's, had some it's right a church. service, right? Easter Sunday that you celebrate the resurrected Christ. Right. Or the resurrected Son. Well. Right? Well, I never looked at it that way, but I know what you're saying. Yes, sir. So it is a service. And we, this is all throughout the South. I did it all the time when I was a kid with my parents. You would set up chairs with your back to the church, usually, face to the east, and have a service while the sun came up. And then you would go eat breakfast. Where did this come from? Where did facing the east as the sun came up, where did it come from? Well, obviously, it didn't come from here. No. Israel. It didn't come from here. It came from before that. You see? It came from here. Now, we can get off into all kinds of stuff, and we will, because I want to. Mm -hmm. Because I want to make sure that I am giving you the whole counsel of God. And I want to take you to a verse right quick. T turn to Deuteronomy 12. Deuteronomy 12. And we'll end with this. We're not going to get too far off into this. Verse 29. Deuteronomy is called the second law. It means the second law. The second giving of the law. Start at verse 28. God says, Observe and hear all these things, all these words which I command thee, that it may go well with thee and, the, and with thy children after thee forever. When you doest that which is good and right, in the sight of the Lord thy God. Remember, Deuteronomy was written at the time when God had taken all the children of Israel, the unbelievers, made them walk around in the wilderness for 40 years, killed them all off, except for two. Right? Joshua, Caleb. And now Deuteronomy gets written. He's, now he's given the law to the new children. Right? The unperverted children. This is what Deuteronomy is about. And this is what he's saying. When the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedeth them and dwelleth in the land. He's saying, when you go over Jordan and you start taking over land and succeeding these people, take heed to yourself that you not be snared by following them. After that, they be destroyed before thee. So after you've destroyed them all, don't be going after them again after you've done that. And that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord, which he hateth, have they done unto their gods. 
for even their sons and daughters they have burned in the fire to their gods. What things soever I command thee, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. God says, this is how it's going to be. When you go into that land, you're going to destroy everything. You're going to destroy all their gods because they're an abomination to me. And you're not even going to ask them. You're not even going to, you're not going to inquire. Wait a minute. Before we do this, how, how, did they, how did they worship the tree god? Or how did they do this? How did they do that? He says, you're not even going to worry about that. Go in there and just get rid of them. Right? I want you to think about this verse when we think about these things. Is it okay? If I'm talking about a Babylonian influence in the church, is it okay that I take a pagan ritual to a pagan god, as Starte, and sunrise, worshiping the sun as the Jews did, make a service out of it and say, I'm, I'm celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm just going to put the name of Jesus Christ on it. God says in Deuteronomy, you're not even going to question how they worship their gods. You're not going to go in there and change, see how they do it and then put your own little spin on it. I want you all to think about that. It's, in, it's very interesting. There is, and we're going to continue to see as we continue to study, a Babylonian influence in the church. And most people don't even know it because it is hidden. It's esoteric. It's pagan. It's something that nobody studies. It's just something that we go along with. And I want to make sure that you don't go along with it. But we're going to say a few things about that. But as we continue. But can we see how close these ancient mysteries look to the Word of God. You change one letter. You know, we said this a long time ago before I started. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the whole Christian faith can be destroyed with one letter. Right? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was God. Was a God. Right? That's what the Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah. what the New World Translation says. You destroy all of Christianity with one letter. And that's exactly what has happened there. But it's come from the beginning. That was way back ancient. They were saying the Son is the glory of God. He is God's Son. That you see these things. And they start tying in. And God's Word's eternal. It's eternal. Right? So as we start looking at these things, what I want you to recognize... And what I want you to think about is as you go into the world, we are surrounded, literally surrounded by people who will say God and who will say Christ and who will say church and who will say all the same language. But they're not talking about the same thing you are. It ain't even close. It's not even close. So what has to happen is we have to ask God, open my eyes, please. Give me discernment that I can see these things when they present themselves. And that when I start presenting the word of God to them, when they go, well, I believe that too. Well, I believe that too. I believe that. Us Masons, we have a Bible. It's part of our decor in, in, in the Christian world, in the Western world. We read it every time I go in the lodge. You see, I'm not saying your guys are around Masons, but that's what they, that's what they talk. They look like a Christian, but they're not. It goes along with the false prophets. And we're going to blend all this stuff in as we continue. But ensure that you know that God's word is pure. And that you're established in his word. Because the people that we're going to start dealing with, I, I believe very soon, and they're already here. They've been around for a long time. Most of the world are talking like this and like Jim Carrey and like Albert Pike and all these people. You see? And it's as we study a little bit more into Alice Bailey, who has some very interesting things to say about tolerance, about inclusion, about exclusion. You see, us, the people, there's going to be fundamentalists who exclude themselves from the love and the unity and solidarity that the world's taking place in, which is Babylonian too. 
that's what we're going to get into a little bit. But as we leave here, hopefully your eyes have been opened a little bit to see the language that a lot of people use. Now, we're in Three Rivers, Michigan. Little town here in Michigan, you know, you might not run into anybody like this. But the fact of the matter is, is most of the world is like this. Most of the world is like this. And um, we need to have our eyes open. Hey, Robbie. Yes, sir. Four brief, very brief things. First of all, I never liked the sunrise services there. Yes, sir. <laughs> up early. Secondly, every person was buried faces east as well. Uh, the Bible calls Satan the master deceiver. Yes. Sir. And it also says that in where sin was found in his heart was that he would be like God. And of course, that's what you've been pointing out here tonight. Yes. Very, very similar, and yet very far off. Right. It is, <laughs> we talk about the Satanist. Satanist is not the, the, the man in black who's walking around. It is the one who looks just like you. You know, wheat and tares look almost the same. A sh we was at the fair the other day, and a sheep and a goat look identical. There's only certain little minute things that they, they but they look identical. You see? They look identical. Yes. Anyway, like you said you don't like uh, that sunrise service. Is that because it was too early? I didn't like getting up there. Because we hear, I'll, I'll say, we, we did that sunrise service. We didn't look to the east, the sun. We served the S-O-N, God, not the S-U-N. And the guy that did uh, biscuits and gravy was a good cook. I just wanted to share that with you. Okay. <laughs> a good cook. Raven, Raven West. We're gonna get more into we're gonna get more into this. Mm -hmm. We're gonna get more into this stuff. Y'all know last year, we'll end up with this. Last year, we're coming up on the season. We know what the season is, right? Seasons greetings, right? Mm -hmm. Xmas. We know all about that. Yeah. I'm not trying to destroy anybody's faith. I'm not trying to do that. What I'm trying to do is point things out that are completely obvious. Remember last year I did preach on Christmas a little bit. Wednesday nights is different. I want everybody to be around here Wednesday nights. Because we're going to get into some stuff about Christmas and Easter and all these things. Just so you can have a... Now I'm going to tell you what to believe. Believe what you want to believe. But I'm telling you what God says... And if you believe what God says, I think you'll be very interested in what you, what you hear about these things. So, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, just for clarity, uh, who do they consider the father? When you say, when you talk about the father and the son, I understand the S-U-N. But who do they think the father is? The father is the, uh, if you go back to Plato, and you go back to, uh, it is Babylonian. But they put it in a different way. We'll see it a little bit. But it's the universal spirit, the universal life force. There's a force out there that's not necessarily personal, but it's the, it is that spirit and that force that create that put everything into existence. And he is he's the one that created the sun. Why? Why I hated Star Wars? Yeah. Right. <laughs> yes. Um, I think uh, a lot of New Age people would refer to it as universe. Universe. Yeah. Universe singular. Right. Yeah, like if universe wills it, you know, or like something like that uh, would be like what their idea of the father is. Yep. And then you could also uh, <coughs> go, they have a, uh, an idea about uh, Saturn, and uh, then that's getting into uh, Gnosticism. We're going to talk about that. So. Yeah, but the, the, for, the force, the Star Wars, right, but the universe Jim Carrey, I'll say this about Jim Carrey too, but all of them say this. They, uh, all the, the New Age teachers, they, Oprah and uh, even the Pope, they all say that call out to the universe and it'll give you what you want. You see, like the, the law of attraction, these kind of things. So, yes, ma'am. Another point of clarity, too. Um, how, do, how do they equate the S-U-N um, dying and resurrecting? I missed that you said it, but I... The, so they, the ancients believed that because their first enemy was darkness, when the sun went down, every time it went down, um, there was no hope unless it was going to rise again every morning. So 
if they considered that life-giving orb gave life to us, if that was the savior of mankind, then it must be, it has to be, that as he gets, as he goes to the, his grave of darkness, he must rise again. If he doesn't rise again, we have no hope, we have no salvation, there's no life on earth. Uh, this may be jumping ahead to something you might talk about in another class, but there's also the, uh, in the winter, the sun dips down uh, is, and then eventually comes back, like in the spring, around the winter e equinox, yeah. which is around the same time as Christmas. We're going to get into that. We're going to get into that a little bit. Right. So are there any questions on what we've got here? It's a lot of stuff. This is heavy stuff. I'm going to tell you, if, and if, when you do this kind of study, <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, Satan does not want you to know this stuff. Yeah. Don't. Because you're going to be able to see exactly what he's doing. You must know your enemy. You can't go on the battlefield unless you know your enemy. And so I think there are a lot of preachers, and, and rightfully so, that only preach the love, uh, the love and the care and... Uh, um, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, rightfully so. Rightfully so. There's, there's these great ministries that talk about the grace of God. And, uh, but there has to be some of this. There has to be some of this. And I, I believe that because it's in the Bible. And so we need to go back and study. And this is one of my, I'm not going to say one of my passions, but it's, it's, this has been one of my burdens is to study this stuff. And I can't understand why, but obviously somebody needs it. So, um, if there are no questions, we'll go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Our Father, you know, Lord God, that you know our hearts. You know, Lord, the study that you have allowed me to do. You know, Lord, that this is a very deep, ancient subject to talk about. A lot of your people have not heard these things. A lot of your people are in darkness uh, when it comes to the things that they see on this earth. I pray tonight, as you've used me, Lord, as a messenger, that... You've opened the eyes and that you would open our hearts to see more clearly about some of these things. And as we continue, according to your will, Lord, and if, if you would have it so, that we would continue to see these hidden things that are right in front of our eyes that just have not been revealed. I pray that you help me as I do research to tell the people what you want them to hear. And as we go out, that we would have an eye for these things and we would warn other people about them as well. I pray that you get the glory and the honor for all the things that we do here. I pray that you keep us safe as we leave here, our families. I pray for my brothers and sisters around the world who are being persecuted for this very thing, for exposing things, and for the testimony of our Lord Jesus. Pray this in your holy name. Amen. Amen.